Hey, third part, first part of Zarathustra. Man, this is taking much longer than I thought. Do I talk too much? I do, eh? So anyway, uh, the next part is called On Little Old and Young Women. Um, and there's not a lot to say here. I don't have too much to say. It's pretty sexist passage um, in which Nietzsche just attempts or purports to describe women. Um, and he says women want children, and this is their ultimate aim. It's their ultimate end. And then, so what that means then is that for women, men are means to this end. That's, you know, their goal is to have children, and the men are just the, the means to it. Men, on the other hand, want danger and play. So they want their women to be the most dangerous plaything. Man should be educated for war and woman for the recreation of the warrior. All else is folly. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to defend Nietzsche on, on that count. Um, he also goes on to say women ought to obey men. Uh, and the quote here is, The happiness of man is, I will. The happiness of woman is, he wills. Behold, just now the world became perfect. Thus thinks every woman when she obeys out of entire love. Just before you write that off, though, the reason I read it out is because that bears a striking resemblance to something we've heard before in the Bible, right? So just be aware of that before you, if you are uh, any Christians out there who want to attack Nietzsche for being sexist, that is not that far removed from what you'll find in the Bible, which I thought was interesting. Um, yeah. On the Adder's Bite is the next part. Uh, and here Zarathustra tells a parable of a poisonous adder that bit him while he was sleeping. Um, upon being bitten, he awoke. He grabbed the snake and told it to take back its poison, which it did by licking around the wound. And basically this little story is a refutation of Jesus' um, teaching of repaying evil with good. So, um, you know, turn the other cheek um, when someone does wrong you know repay them with with love kind of um, that that attitude that that uh, idea and he's saying actually you know there's nothing wrong with getting a little bit back and he recommends getting a little angry at times joining in a little with the swearing if someone swears at you doing a few small wrongs if you've done a great wrong exacting a little revenge rather than none and punishing transgressors after all punishment is also a right and an honor for the transgressor so um yeah just um it's fine to to um to get a little bit back right and uh and included in that so again it, it's not just about um punishing because you, you you feel wronged so this is not about revenge right this is not about revenge at all it's just about um well <laughs> he says it is actually exacting a little revenge rather than none but um but the motive shouldn't be vengeance it shouldn't be you shouldn't be trying to get back you should be um it should go no further than just um kind of showing your own strength Showing your own, um, making clear that, that you, you know, you're here. This was your, you, 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 um, you can defend what you've done. Um, and, and also the, the point about punishment being a right and an honor for the transgressor. Again, there, there's more of that um, struggle is um, <clears throat> important for for progress, for, for development, for individual development. If everything is soft and easy, then the individual is going to be soft and easy as well. So getting a little bit back actually makes the the person who's doing all the dishing out, it help, actually helps them. It, it, it makes them stronger as well. So anyway, there's that. Uh, the next section was on child and marriage. And here he says a man must be entitled to wish for a child. He must be, quote, the victorious one, the self-conqueror, 
the commander of your senses, the master of your virtues. Um, and so there, uh, again, there's that, that whole idea that you, um, if you're gonna, if you're gonna create, if you're gonna create a baby, create a child, a new life, you need to be worthy of that task. You need to be up to it. Um, <clears throat> Because that's what we're doing. We, you, you, you should be here creating a creator, right? Um, one that is more than those who created it. That's that's the quote. Um, so it's not something that ought to be undertaken lightly, or um, something that, that anybody can kind of you know freely or easily get into. There should be you. You, you have to have some kind of um, you have to be worthy of, of, of having a child. And he also says, interestingly enough, in a marriage founded on reverence for each other. So that's interesting, right? It's, it's a little bit different from what he said before about women being, um, you know, having to obey the man. There's, he, he's a little bit more egalitarian here, a marriage founded on reverence for each other. And uh, he then goes on to pour scorn on the marriages of the all too many or the, or the superfluous, which he compares to two beasts finding each other rather than you know, two um, independent, self-empowered human beings creating life, creating a creator. So this, this, this um, underlying... Um, current in Nietzsche's thought is that there is this progress. You know, you you're having a child which is going to be greater than than you and your partner. So there's and there's this continual striving for greatness, for more greatness. Um, and I think that underlies a lot of Nietzsche's philosophy as well. So there are only two more chapters, two more sections left. The, the first one is on free death. And here he talks about death as being something momentous, but not an occasion for sadness and pity. <clears throat> it should be a, quote, spur and promise to the survivors, end quote. Um, it, in other words, a consummation of a life lived well. And he calls this a victorious death. So it's um, kind of the opposite of the way we normally treat death. You know, it's, we treat death surrounded with, with mourning and there should be a period of mourning and, you know, lots of crying and tears and, and, um, and, and a kind of feeling of the injustice of things. Um, but that's not what death means for Nietzsche. So the free death in particular, the, what does he mean when he says free death? That's the death that comes when we will it. And associated with this is the idea that we ought to die at the right time. Um, so when is the time? When's the right time? At the right time for his goal and heir. That's, that's what Nietzsche says. The right time is when it's the right time for his goal and heir. So the way I interpret this, or the way I understand it, is that um, w with a grand goal, you've got some kind of grand ambition, and you need an heir to continue it, to pursue it, to follow it on, right, to keep it going. And the right time to die will be that time when you have taught and shown your pupil or student all you can, and they've become better able than you to pursue it. So you, you are now um, kind of um, superfluous. You know? you, you've become a little bit redundant. And in, in that the, the goal that you have, that you had, you're no longer able to, to keep up the push, the drive for it. You're no longer able to maintain that... that, that um, to carry on that that drive with the same energy that you that you used to be able to, and someone else can better take it over from you. Um, and so, presumably, then at this point, you ought to step aside and die a noble death. 
So there is this idea again of progress and um, and that being the main focus. You know, there's, there's a little bit of tension here perhaps in that the individual is so crucial, right, to Nietzsche's thought, the individual, the creator, um, as opposed to the mass, the, the many. But in, in his, his kind of progress forward, his, his ever, um, ever forward-moving um, desire, his, his passion forward, it, it's, it, that is greater than the individual. And so, and so we get this idea of a free death where um, you're no longer the best uh, to carry on this, this the, to, to hold the torch, to move towards this goal. And at that point, you ought to just give it over to the, to the younger, to the, to the better able, the next generation. And you can see where Nietzsche is getting this from, right? Just from nature. I mean... That's just the way nature is, right? You know that the plant grows, it, um, it it sends out its its seeds, and then new plants grow up, and the old plants die. And it's the same in the animal kingdom too, right? The old lion, who who's no longer the the he's no longer able to protect his pride, will be usurped by the younger, the more capable, the more able. And when he is, that's not an occasion for sadness. That's just, that's just the way uh, nature works. That's the way life is. So he has this really kind of raw um, understanding of life, and it, it's it's almost Darwinian. You want to say, um, but but Nietzsche was not Darwinian at all, he, and he hated. Um, Darwin's Darwinism, but but there is an an element of it here, I think, where it's it it is just um, the progression of the species in this case can can take precedence over the individual, in contrary to what much of his philosophy is about. There, so that's what I mean. I think it sounds like there is a little bit of attention there, right? Um, so the good death, the free death. Um, he particularly detests the all too many who drag out their all too long lives. Um, the quote, would that a storm come, would that a storm came to shake all this worm-eaten rot from the tree. Um, and again, there's that idea, you know, the old ought to just step aside and let the young, the the, the, the more energetic, the more powerful come through and continue on the drive. And if they you know they hang on too long, then it only leads to um, uh, to you know to a, a reduction in in vitality. It just it only holds things up, stifles things. Um, <clears throat> and presumably he's thinking like you know a dying, wheezing and bedridden, uh, someone who who is kind of bedridden after a protracted illness, um, and then is is kind of slowly dying, but but holding on to life as long as possible. That's not a good death for Zarathustra or Nietzsche. It's um, you know you, you should leave before you get to that stage, and then um, you've given something for the next. For your your heir, as Nietzsche calls it, to um, to carry on and, and and move towards. So interestingly enough, too, he says Jesus died too early, and again, there's this idea that Jesus was, you know, he had some respect for Jesus, um, and he says uh, he died too early when quote he knew only tears and the melancholy of the Hebrew. And the idea here is that if Jesus had lived longer, he might have recanted his teaching and, quote, learned to live and to love the earth and laughter too. So there's, you know, Jesus was 
it was he was a creator, so he's got that for him. But as I said before, Nietzsche may not have agreed with the values that that Jesus um, promoted, but if it had more time, if he hadn't got caught up in that. Uh, in pity and compassion and, and the weakness that he did get caught, caught up in, then he might have learned to live and to love the earth and laughter too, and it would have um, he would have he would have come around to Nietzsche's way of thinking. Uh, so the final section on the gift giving virtue, and here he says the uh, gift giving virtue is the highest virtue. So uh, with this ultimate goal in mind, giving. Like Zarathustra is giving back, right? He wants to teach. He wants to impart his wisdom. Um, with this idea, giving back, giving of itself, the lover of knowledge accumulates his wealth. And Zarathustra calls this a holy selfishness. Um, selfishness which seeks to, to gather and collect for itself in order to later give open up with open arms, right? Um, the other kind of selfishness, however, is a sick one, which always wants to steal. It's an inward kind of shrinking, um, which, again, Nietzsche is all about expansion and, and, and the outward drive. Um, so he says, gift giving, a couple of things, gift giving must stay with the earth, with life, um, that it may give the earth a meaning, a human meaning. So he just, again, wants this to be something firmly rooted in the here and now. The earth, um, I'm always catching when he says the earth, it, I always read that as being as being in opposition to an afterlife, the, a heaven and God and, and that, that, that whole um, superstitious framework. So he tells, so at this point Zarathustra tells his disciples to leave him and be suspicious of his teachings. Uh, if they are to make good overtures for the Ubermensch, they must be creators, not merely accepting dogma, no matter the source. And there's a good quote here, one repays a teacher badly if one always remains nothing but a pupil. Now I bid you lose me and find yourselves. So, even to the point of his own, when he's talking about his own teachings, he's saying, you know, you've got to come up with something for yourselves. Don't just take my word for it. These are my truths. These are my values. I'm teaching you to, to make your own, create your own. Of course, the complete opposite of, of all other moral systems, including Christianity. Um, so despite his criticisms here of reason, education, and philosophers, knowledge is very important, I think, here. Um, and he particularly detested the attitude towards knowledge that his contemporaries had. Um, he's, so he says, my quote, which will just about end us, uh, take us out with this, with knowledge, the body purifies itself. Making experiments with knowledge, it elevates itself. In the lover of knowledge, all instincts become holy. In the elevated, the soul becomes gay. So there's, um, so knowledge was good. Knowledge was good. It was just the way it was used by other people that Nietzsche didn't like. Knowledge is good. It's it, it's a, it's a it progresses. It moves forward. It carries you forward, but it has to be. Um, it has to be gathered in the right way and used in the right way. And that's the first part of Zarathustra, of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So, um, yeah, we'll keep going with part two next time. I'm actually enjoying this more than I thought I would. It's uh, really, he's an interesting character. I still can't, I still, I don't think I can get on board with him all the way, but... Um, but he's definitely interesting. And Eke Homo, I really recommend you read that. He's, uh, if you, it just, I recommend you read his other, some of his other works first and then get into Eke Homo. It's not long, it's only about 100 pages. But, um, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's quite illuminating, I think. Um, yeah. Anyway, till next time.